How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. It is Friday here on this program. You know what that means? We've got a lot to talk about heading into the weekend. And it's funny, I just realized right now, the moment I started doing this show, that uh, I got all sorts of news here to talk about today. And, uh, and I have a screaming child downstairs. And I just realized I didn't have a word in this about the uh, Money in the Bank show, which is tomorrow. So uh, it's funny. Uh, Money in the Bank, business-wise, in terms of, of attendance and gate, etc., I mean, it's it's doing huge. Secondary market ticket price, like 80 bucks a ticket, which is the highest of any wrestling event right now. So, like, from that perspective, the show is is big. But from the perspective of uh, seemingly the viewers, certainly the listeners to this show and the people on our website, it's like nobody cares about this show. So, uh, very interesting. But we will uh, give you the full lineup here today and talk about it. And uh, get your thoughts on all of the stories we're going to talk about today, including Jeff Hardy, who certainly did a thing. He pled not guilty. He pled not guilty to his recent DUI charge. I presume there must be some clerical explanation as to why he did this. But uh, a point two nine four and a point two nine one legal limits point oh eight. You know, footage, there's uh, footage from the police, and he entered rehab, but he pled not guilty. Anyway, I don't know. We got uh, Dynamite, broke one million for blood and guts. We've got SmackDown coming up tonight. Bunch of notes on Forbidden Door. And, of course, in the second segment of the show, Dave Meltzer will join us to talk all of the news from the latest edition of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. So stick around. We'll be back in a moment to kick it off. Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. A lot of news to get into here today, including this. Jeff Hardy has pled not guilty to his recent DUI charge. According to PW Insider, Hardy filed a written plea of not guilty on June 28th. He is scheduled to be arraigned on July 5th. In regard to his arrest for DUI in the morning of June 13th in uh, Volusia County, Florida, Hardy is said to have entered a rehab facility on June 21st. So I guess he comes out of rehab for this arraignment, or what happens? Or maybe his lawyer just handles that. Been charged with one count each of driving under the influence of drugs, alcohol, which would be his third offense in 10 years, driving with a canceled, suspended, or revoked license, violating restrictions placed on a driver's license. Mark Romandi added further details on Hardy's arrest. He left the car, was unsteady, smelled of alcohol. The officers learned he had been drinking. He could not complete any portion of sobriety exercises successfully, quote, or without risk of falling. They administered a breath test. First sample, 0.294. Second, 0.291. Legal limit is 0.08. So both of those over three times the legal limit. He has entered into rehab, yet he has pled not guilty. So sometimes you hear something like this and it's just like mind-blowing, and it turns out there's some clerical reason for whatever the plea is. I presume that has to be what's going on here because there's a lot of evidence here, including him willingly entering rehab it seems odd to plead not guilty but i guess as they say we'll see we'll see what happens plus he's got a public history that the prosecution depending on how hard they want to come after him and how big of a case they want this to be could bring up and dredge up But I agree with you. I look at this. I have no idea. I've never been in this situation. Never will be in this situation, I hope. And it's got to be maybe they want to have him finish rehab first and then go into the trial because there's no way he gets out of this with nothing. At the very least, he had a suspended license, did he not? So there's going to be ramifications that come from this. But I have a feeling it's got to be something where 
it's got to be some legal issue or something that may help him and benefit him because he looks pretty guilty on paper to me. That's what the video showed for sure, but we'll see. So uh, yesterday, the Dynamite ratings came out. Uh, 1.023 million viewers on TBS, up 16.5% from the previous week. Best audience since March 23rd. Dynamite's fifth highest viewership to date since moving to TBS. 0.36, 18 to 49, up 17%. Number one on cable. 33% ahead of number two on cable. And was only beaten by four shows on the major broadcast networks. Highest 18 to 49 since April 20th. Uh, it was uh, up across all demos, except females 12 to 34, which was down 5.6% from last week. Although, I think it won the night in males or females 12 to 34. Biggest increase, males 12 to 34, up 30%. Biggest increase was with people over 50, up 16% from the same week in 2021, uh, which was, by the way, the week that AEW returned to live touring. So a uh, very, very good number, which caused uh, a lot of people to lose their mind. And no, not me. But in a good way or a bad way? So yesterday, I I, uh, apparently on my computer... I, I I'm not I'm like a hundred years old, so I I I tweeted out the ratings from my computer. Normally I tweet from my phone, so apparently on my computer the settings are for some reason that uh, nobody can respond unless I think it, I don't know what the setting was, but so I, I mean, actually David been for, messing with this for recently, once. Haven't you? Well, he's doing it on purpose. I wasn't. <laughs> it was an accident. So for once in my life. I tweeted out the ratings, but nobody was allowed to comment. And I found out about this about 15 minutes later. Conspiracy. Nah, don't you find were... out about nothing. Well, you no, hold on, the heat. hold on a second, Mike. <laughs> that doesn't even make sense for a conspiracy, because a conspiracy would be if the number were very low and I didn't allow comments. It makes no sense for me not to allow comments when it's high. Well, when you're on the think, payroll like that, maybe you're just tired of the pushback that you get every time you post it up there, you know? So then, so then <laughs> once I figured it out, it was like, well, I, I just, I got to, we got to give the people what they want, as Excalibur would say. <laughs> so I tweeted it again, and I allowed everybody to comment. And, uh, and then I, you know, I, I did a bunch of tweets, paid by Tony Khan, can't run the ropes, whatever. <laughs> and uh, then, then the weirdest thing is, I started getting emails. I started getting people on Twitter and on the board thinking that I'd been hacked. <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, I just, I was just flabbergasted. And then everyone's like, oh, he's gloating. Which, by the way, was one of my tweets that I was gloating. Which, <laughs> like, dude, you know, sometimes I think that the people, I don't want to say anything bad about oh, people. Oh, man. But man, oh man, bro! I fig- get I with the program, you nerds. Come on! I figured it out. You were scared. You were scared because you thought people would make fun of the number being too low. But then, then the response came out, and it's like, well, that's a pretty good number. The first one did 1.088 million people. So good, they're over a million. And once you did that, you realized it was okay to come out of your shell and from out of behind the hiding, from the arms of Tony Khan, who has probably hugged you on a cruise sometime. The same way he hugged Okada, and the same way he hugged Claudio. And by the way, his name is Claudio, Brian. How do you how do you say his name? Come on, say it. You know, it's funny is I don't know if I've ever actually been hugged by Tony Khan, but I do I do think the very first time I ever met Tony Khan. Do you know what his first words to me were? I shouldn't say this because then Twitter's going to totally go nutty. I love the newsletter. He said, "Super Chico." There we go. Yeah. Hey. You know what I told People him? People love calling you Chico, I though. I said I hate that name. Oh. That was my first words to Tony Khan. No. Damn. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> and he still put you on the payroll. That's uh, that's the numbers. And listen, hey, the numbers are good. And, of course, everybody went crazy again because that's what we have to do. You know, you know it was, uh, uh, oh, it was a special show. I think Dave used the term hot shotting, which uh, hot shotting. I'm going to have to ask him about that one. I don't think this was hot shotting. I don't believe he, so. He he tried to explain that like 
Well, you know, in the old days, if you were, did a bunch of blood and violence, that was considered hot shotting. And uh, to me, hot shotting is like you're hot shotting something. Yeah. And if you've got a show that you've built up for five weeks or whatever, and then you deliver what was advertised, I don't really think that's hot shotting. No. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, you know, young and have a different definition, but this would be like well, saying even, that they Brian, hot shotted WrestleMania because it was like a big special show that you only do once a year. Yeah, well, well, yeah, even, but it's like Blood and Guts is at the same time every year. It was this time last year, right? Yeah, around they it, They promoted yeah. it for... But here's the other thing. Here's the other thing. Let's just say that, uh, you know, you want to use the excuse that, well, it was Blood and Guts. That's why the number was big. The number won't be as big next week. Well, you're right. It probably isn't going to be as big next week. But I don't... Do you guys recall that, like, there were a lot of shows lately where they had some big thing that was going on. Like, you know, CM Punk is going to show up and he's got a big announcement and this and that. And none of those things did huge numbers. So, you know, this was a good number. And obviously, Blood and Guts was a big part of that. Probably Fallout from Forbidden Door was a big part of that. It's probably not going to be over a million next week. But this was certainly a very, very good number for a show that was promoted for a long time. And they delivered. So, good for them. Yeah, I didn't look at it unless he says it's like a hot shot concept that they came up with at the last minute but it's uh yeah i mean i i have a differing opinion the the same way you do when it comes to the thought behind the whole thing but you know what if we could always ask him about it when we come back from break i think i'm just gonna ask him about the new observer back in a moment Probably. observer live all right back here on the show brian elbert is here wrestling observer live where you're attempting to get dave connected as we speak so when i hear from him I will uh, let you know. So uh, these things always happen to me. You know what I'm going to do? Mike, I'm going to call Dave uh, on the phone. It's very exciting, isn't it, everybody? Watch this. Maybe you'll get to hear Dave's answering machine. Hello? Hey, let's just do the phone. Okay, no problem. All right, we're live, by the way, so here we go. Okay. All right, we got Dave here, everybody, and Mike as well. And uh, new issue of The Observer is on the front page of WrestlingObserver.com right now. We've got a lot of stories in there. And uh, the top story is about business for the Forbidden Door show, which ultimately appears to have done very well, Dave. What can you tell us? Yeah, I mean, um, it's really interesting to see because it was a very different audience, a lot more than most thought as compared to, like, uh, Double or Nothing. But it looks like it did about 127,000 buys on pay-per-view, which is not not like as high as the previous couple of shows have done. But it was a one-month build, um, you know, as far as, as far as that, and it was a new show. And I mean, I think that most people considered that number well above expectation, so it was a good sign, you know. Um, very heavily U.S.-based, um, not as much uh, European as the other shows, but I think a lot of that is. Uh, Sunday's tougher for Europeans because of the, uh, um, you know, it's it's like 1 to 5 a.m. or something during, you know, 1 to 6 a.m., you know, 1 to 5 a.m., I believe. So on a, on, when, when there's work the next day, so it's tougher, you know, where Saturday you can justify it better. But um, in the United States, Sunday's a better pay-per-view night. So, you know, and the United States is where the majority of the um, orders come from. So they're going to take precedence. So so explain what you mean by a different audience from your normal AEW pay-per-view. More New Japan well, fan-heavy? Yeah, I mean, I think some of it will be New Japan fans, but whatever it was, um, of the people who bought this pay-per-view, uh, 61% bought Double or Nothing and 39% did not. So it was, for 39%, they're not people who bought the previous show. I don't know. I, I haven't checked to see if they had bought other shows, but... Um, it was more. I, I had thought it would be more like the same audience, and while you know a lot of the audience is the same, um, a lot of the a lot more of the audience is different than I thought it would be. Dave, this may be a silly question, but I was kind of thinking leading into the pay per view, everybody when it got to the pre show, if you were going to buy this show, you were already sitting there tuned in and waiting to see it. I the way the thing built up, it didn't feel like there were going to be too many stragglers on the fence at the last minute. But do we know and is it measurable how many people ordered the show, you know, in the lead up? And and is that a a number that we can find out? 
everybody buys the last minute, so it's like it doesn't really tell you anything. I mean, okay. I mean, I saw like like cable numbers like two days ahead, and you know, it's nobody. You know, because nobody buys on Thursday or Friday. Everyone buys on Sunday. You know, I mean, that's just how it is. So there's really no way to measure like the effect of you know a good pregame show versus you know and what that means. There's just no there's no way to know. So something we've actually not talked about at all on this particular show is uh, Rocky Johnson's six kids. Eight. Eight? Yeah. Eight, but five, five, new, five new Five ones. new children, yes. Everybody knew about Dwayne, and everybody knew about the two, the two kids from the first marriage. But there were, yeah, the rest were new. So, so what happened here? I, Tell the story. I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, what, what, what essentially I think happened is, is that um, some of them found out, and then they contacted um, Jay, who's Ricky Johnson is the name that most people know him, you know, Jay Bowles, um, who's Rocky's brother, who lives in Canada, and, and they, they're all Canadian. So it just was one of those things where um, he, you know, they, they found him, some did DNA tests, and it's been Greg Oliver has no is, is good friends with with Ricky, so he's known about it and waited to do the story and interview the different people. It was really a fascinating, it's fascinating story. I had no clue over you know that, that any about any of this basically. So yeah. So so this is this is a group of children in Canada. Yes, in different parts of Canada. You know, depending on where Toronto, where he wrestled. You know, uh, Nova Scotia, where he wrestled and also grew up. And also Vancouver, where he worked before he came to Los Angeles and became a really big, big star. Although he was a star in Vancouver too, so it was like the different places he worked before coming to uh, California. And that's where he, that's where he met Atta, and you know, and him and Atta were together, you know, for for a long, long time. And then they split up later too. But um, yeah, Dwayne was like a, an only child, although he did have the the two half brothers that I'm sure he knew about. But I don't know if he knew about. I don't know if he knew about the other ones. I I'd, I'd never, you know, again, I you know, but he, Okay, I'd, so so these children were all conceived in places that he worked in Canada. Yes. But he also worked in a lot of other different places. Yes, but that was also after uh, Atta. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Which which is not to say that we're not going to find somebody elsewhere. I have no idea. Sure. You know. Yeah, but conceivably yeah. there's there's Rock's got a lot more brothers and sisters potentially out there. You know, I would think so, just because the the idea that there's so many that we know about, and a lot of people don't get DNA tests and stuff. You know, because what happened is, is, is some of them just would, you know, they would, you know, they knew they didn't know who their father was. They got a DNA test, and all of a sudden it like said, "Oh, you got this half brother." And because other people had taken DNA tests that were part of the family, and you know, um, and Ricky had a DNA test, so it led them to that. So if you were like adopted or something. And you, your mother never told you that it was a pro wrestler, or didn't know her. And you looked like The Rock. <laughs> yeah, well, some. Of Isn't that what like one the of the rock. kids said? It was like uh, people said yeah. I look like The Rock. People get saying. It looked a little bit like The Rock, yeah. yeah. But if you're like if you're one of the daughters, the daughters didn't really look like The Rock. The sure. daughters, you know. But um, I mean, yeah, conceivably there could be more. Dave, you've had a good relationship, and obviously have talked to Dwayne uh, a lot. There have been lots of uh, accusations. There's been lots of stories about his father over the years. Um, and now there is now this coming out, the autobiography, which was obviously a, a very controversial thing for several reasons, ended up being off the market. Does he reconcile this in the conversations you have with him? Is it just one of those things that he has to, obviously you got to shrug off and you keep going. He's got a lot going on in his life, but how does it affect him to your knowledge? And in the times you've spoken to him, how does he reconcile it? I can't really answer that fairly um, because I mean, I mean, I've talked to him and the subject comes up, but I've never had an in-depth discussion with him. I mean, obviously you can watch, the TV show, which is kind of like his vision, where I think I think that he loves his father in his own way, and at the same time is not, you know, he clearly knows his father was a con man and tries to make it, you know, and 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 made a lot of bad decisions. I mean, you you know, you watch the show and it's like Rocky Johnson isn't like portrayed like negatively, like he dislikes him, but you can see the heartbreak of certain things that Rocky Johnson did that weighed on him, you know, over. You know, over his life, you know, looking when he looks back. All right, so uh, we got money in the bank tomorrow, and uh, doesn't seem like there's a lot of interest, except unless you're buying tickets. 
well, I mean, the show sold out, and and the secondary market's fairly strong. But yeah, I mean, I I, I mean, I guess there's there's always the curiosity over who's going to win the two money in the bank matches. But you know, the rest of the show, yeah, there's nothing. I mean, it's not it's not one of those shows that grabs you. But in the Vegas market, it's uh, you know it's doing okay. It, it, it you know it is sold out, and um, without Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar, you know it's the top guys, and so I mean that's a feather in their cap, I guess. But you know which the, the concept, um, you know I, I I think that there's interest in who's going to win and then what happens from there. You know maybe more on the women's side than the men's side, only because. You know, I think there's almost that feeling that nobody can win the men's title except for Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar, whereas the women's titles, you know that they can bounce around. Is it true that WWE is is determined to make Logan Paul a babyface? Oh, no. <laughs> um, I mean, we'll find out, but it's certainly, don't you think, from, from Raw and Monday where Miz cut the promo and everything? And I know ri- originally when Logan Paul came in, the deal wasn't that came from his side, not their side, that he had to be a babyface at the end. Like, he could come in as a heel, but when the story is over, he had to be a babyface. And, you know, every time they try to make him a babyface, it backfires. Look, he was in Cleveland, his hometown, talking about, I went to high school here, I was, you know, in the state wrestling meet. He did everything to get himself cheered in his hometown, and he got booed. So this guy, get, you know, this is like a Floyd Mayweather. You know, if they really want to make him a baby face, it's a, going to be an uphill battle, and they'll probably at some point, like they did the other times, they'll probably have to give up. Dave, well, did Tyson well, let, me just say one thing, let me say one thing real quick. So they did do that on Monday, but, I mean, if he were going to be a heel and team with Miz, you'd have to do that same promo if you're putting him back together after WrestleMania. Um, I suppose, but it sure, sure felt to me like he was going to work against the Miz. Yes. Um, you know, down maybe not right away, and maybe they'll do another split. But I certainly got the impression that is him against them is is, is the the long term direction, um, and that would make him in theory a baby face. Although the last time him and Miz were you know had their little to do, everybody cheered the Miz, if you remember. Did Tyson Fury make a grandstand challenge to Jake Paul, or am I imagining this uh, in the last wasn't week or so? His, was, wasn't that just for his brother? Okay, was that what it was? For, okay, yeah, it was. For, it was for Tommy Fury. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. I was wondering what no, was no, going no, on with all that I, sort of stuff. Tyson Fury and Jake Paul is the most ridiculous match in the history of the world. <laughs> well, I, mean, I was it, like, I'm trying to figure out how you can get that in a WWE ring. That sounds perfect. Oh, in a, w, in a WWE ring, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, um, maybe maybe after he fights his brother, maybe they can do that. Um, I think. Well, I think WWE would probably like to use. Um, Tyson Fury to get over one of their own, you know, one of their full timers, rather than just do pure celebrity. Although pure celebrity, probably at a WrestleMania, if you did that, would be wacky enough to where it would get an incredible amount of attention. And that match well, would get an it, incredible amount of. Well, attention. actually, we got to head to a break. But thanks, Dave. We'll plug the Observer after the break. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi. You all right over there? Yeah, I'm trying to find something here. So you'd be stressed out in between breaks as well, too. Well, dude, so it's, chaos it's, downstairs? No, it's 200 degrees in this house is the problem. Man. Yeah. Why so warm? Because it's summer. Well, well, you don't have air conditioning in that palace? Well, I have air conditioning. You have dual it, air conditioners, do you not? Want actually, I don't, have du- I don't have dual. Oh. I wish I did. But uh, downstairs is not hot enough for the air conditioning to come on. But this room. Bro, you want to see what's in this room? Well, you can't. But there's a lot of stuff that generates a lot of heat. Mm-hmm. Not the least of which is me. Now, if you go to my Twitter <laughs> at Brian Alvarez, yes, yes, our our uh, our good friend Ryan Frederick, his uh, his best bud Cooper, his dog Cooper, needs a surgery, Aww. and he's trying to uh, to raise some money. He's got a GoFundMe here, and actually, he's only five hundred dollars away right now. So, if you got a couple of bucks laying around, if you go to at Brian Alvarez on Twitter. I'm not really a dog guy, but when you see this dog, yeah, really, you and your money will soon be parted. Oh, for old, a good reason too. Old, oh, it's Copper, not Cooper. Copper, yeah, yeah. It tore his ACL, and man, surgery is not cheap. And as anybody who's got a four-legged friend or any pet knows, you know, it, it is hard. They're like they're a member of your family. So I completely understand this so. you know copper's a cute name but for a gofundme he should have he should have said his name was cooper why just a cuter name am i wrong 
Yes. Okay. Well, anyway, Copper is uh, he is in need of your assistance. So, at Brian Alvarez on Twitter, if you want to uh, to donate, maybe by the end of the show we could have his surgery paid off, and maybe a little bit extra for some for some doggy treats. We can yeah, reward some doggy him ice with cream him. after that. Absolutely. I don't know if dogs can eat ice cream. Well, they got the the doggy ice cream. It's all made for them. Dog what is you doggy ice this? cream? Yeah, you no, I don't have dogs. What's a doggy oh, ice good. cream? They actually have ice cream that dogs can eat. And a lot of places, actually, there's a lot of ice cream places and creameries that are doing this, too, and having it. So when you walk up and, you know, you have the, the dog with you and everything, the, the dog can have a treat as well. Yeah, everyone seems to think that Copper is a cuter name. Yeah, for a dog, sure. This guy thinks Cooper might be his, his NXT name. Yeah, they would absolutely change it if now that's the one thing you got to worry about with something like this. Maybe somebody donates so much. Uh, I wonder if they could talk Copper into being taken away from, from Ryan and, and, and Triple H picks him up. And there's a picture of, of Copper posing with Triple H and we'd change his name to, you know, what what would it be? Would it be Cooper? Well, see, here's the thing also. What would be a last name for a dog in NXT? I don't even want to get into that with his dog, but... Uh... I think the reason I think Cooper is a cuter name is because it trolls. You know that that movie Trolls? Paisley loved that movie. And one of the characters was named Cooper. And she loved Cooper. And she had all these Cooper dolls all over the house. Yeah. So the name has a soft spot in my heart. And if you're a big Cooper Cup fan, as long as you know. Name her Kid Cooper. So I'm win the Super Bowl, you might be able to to spread some of that same cheer that you had watching him win and pass it on to Ryan and help out with the, with Copper. We well, got some names here: Copper Fur Dog. That's a good one, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. actually too good for NXT. Cooper D Paws. I like that one. Cooper D <laughs> Paws. Cooper Paws. Yeah. I got to put the D in there. Cooper it's like D-paws. Coco Beware. Hell yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though Dave refused to ever put that B in. That's he did. Of all things. <laughs> Cooper, so did PWI. They, Cooper they didn't D either. Paws. What? Bro, if you're a wrestler, why would you choose the last name where if your middle name wasn't B? Right? So you, you should respect his name by calling him Coco Beware. That's what he wanted to be called. That's what I say. Exactly. It'd be hard to take away that, that B, and it doesn't mean anything anymore. The old days were different, Brian. They were different. different. Okay, we got some more news here. I guess we should talk about Money in the Bank, huh? Sure. Well, first off, SmackDown is tonight. Ah. It is the go-home show. Uh, We've got uh, six of the seven participants in the Women's Money in the Bank will be in action on SmackDown tonight. We've got Raquel, Lacey, and Shotzi versus Asuka, Alexa, and Liv Morgan. And, of course, Becky is the seventh participant. We've also got... Vince loves his stupid words. We've got a Money in the Bank cavalcade. A cavalcade. That's one of my favorite words. Seth, Drew, Sheamus, Omas, Sami Zayn, and Riddle. <laughs> Much still... like Great Balls of Fire, taking it back to the 50s with that one, like the Gillette cavalcade of sports at your Nickelodeon before the movie began. And so there's still one, uh, notwithstanding, notwithstanding, one spot <laughs> left in the Money in the Bank. <laughs> So the lineup for the show, Bianca Belair versus Carmella for the Raw Women's title. Seth, Drew, Sheamus, Omos, Sammy, Riddle, and TBD for the Men's Money in the Bank briefcase. Lacey, Alexa, Liv, Raquel, Asuka, Shotzi, Becky for the Women's Money in the Bank. Ronda versus Natty for the SmackDown Women's title. The Usos versus the Street Profits for the SmackDown Tag Team titles, where the storyline is, they just can't beat the Usos. That's a great storyline. That really makes me interested in this match. And Theory will be facing Bobby Lashley for the U.S. title. You know, I talked about this with talking about the new look of Fabian Eichner, and I like it. I like, actually, the Giovanni Vinci presentation thus far. And he looks like he could be a star. We know he can work. But it also drives me nuts that they didn't take Imperium as a whole unit, bring them up to the main roster, because just like Otis and Gable, yeah, they're going to lose handicap matches to a top guy because that's what happens there. But 
to have them up as a tag team when you need tag teams and they are so good at what they can do and they can still be the heavies for Walter in the same way that the Usos are. I mean, other than the Street Profits, they would have been the third biggest tag team in the company. And I think you could have you could have done a lot with them. And it's just amazing. And I've been saying this since 1990, whatever it is. Tag teams can be very, very valuable if you want them to be and you invest in them. It doesn't take much, and I get it. A heavyweight championship match is still always going to be the main event at the Tokyo Dome or WrestleMania or wherever, but you can invest in some of these feuds, have more teams going at it, and make it useful. I know that's a lot to ask for, but, you know, it it is possible. Somebody apparently wanted me to talk about this. Whenever people yeah. want me to talk about something, there's always an expectation. Well, you usually don't like being told what to talk about. I don't like being told what to talk about. So Former NXT Women's Champion Io Shirai could be Ooh. on the verge of becoming a free agent. In the latest edition of the Observer Newsletter, Dave Meltzer reported Io Shirai's contract with the WWE was set to expire next month if she doesn't sign a new deal. She has not signed WWE's newest contract offer. Meltzer notes that Sh- Shirai, quote, had told people in Japan that when her contract was up, she wanted to return to Japan and be closer with her family. So I'm not sure what the expectation is for me in this story right here. I suspect that the person who wanted me to address this is very, very angry about this. Angry? Yeah. You because, believe? Yeah, because he's mad that they don't do anything with Yoshirai. She did not go into the main roster. They've wasted... Well, listen, buddy. I don't know what he's mad about, but, I mean, if, if that's what he's expecting from me. Well, can I offer you a different hypothesis Bro, here? Bro, you guys are asking for analysis. Different theory? Dude, what analysis do you want? She's stuck in NXT. They're not going to bring her up to the main roster. They've had opportunity after opportunity. She wants to go back to Japan. Good for her! Do you think maybe What analysis this- do you want? Hold on a second, Mike. Oh, boy. Rose, Listen. Listen. You, you, you suffer. <laughs> you. I'm looking for the word. <laughs> you. you suffer because you want something that you're not going to get. Okay. How you long? Masochists. How long have we been watching WWE? How long has Vince McMahon been in charge? How long has this happened over and over and over and over again? I'm not mad at the person who wants me to talk about this, but I'm I'm irritated you guys want some in-depth analysis. Bro, it's been like this forever, okay? Vince, he doesn't get it. In Vince's mind, they've got Asuka. So what do we need a Yushirai for? That's what goes on in his mind. So why do people get angry about this? I, I don't get it. I'm happy for her if she wants to go back to Japan, be close to her family, and maybe go work a bunch of stardom shows. Good for her! Right? Did he type this in all caps or something? I don't know. Because, I mean, what you could maybe take from this is he's asking you. Now I'm sweating even more in this hot room. (laughs) Because he's asking you about it. Because this opens up a door if there is no, especially if there's no... Uh, thirty-day clause, or it's waived if she were to leave the country. That people aren't excited over the thought of her going back to a place where she was a star, a superstar, and the reason that WWE wanted to bring her over for that May Young gimmick in the first place is because imagine what she could do working with Kari Sane, who just left from over there. Imagine her working with people that have now displaced her in stardom. Your uh, Tommy Hayashishidas, your your Shuris, your your people like that, your Julias. Um, can you imagine Julia and Io Shirai, how much attention you can get for that? So maybe they ask so they could actually do the fantasy booking in their own minds on what could come next, not what has happened in the past. People are maybe looking at this as a big positive as opposed to the negative of the past. Well, it is a big positive. Listen, if she were on the main roster, making main roster money and being featured, and she was happy living in Florida with her family, and by the way, I'm 100% talking about Oscar right here, that's one thing. But if you're working in NXT 2.0, 
and you're not making that kind of money, and you're working with people who don't know how to work, and you've been injured countless times, leave! Which appears to be what she wants to do. How long has she been there now? Way when too she... long! <laughs> so, well, it's been since... That May Young was 2017. It's been five years, five years Pounding away on this from desk. Home. Five years away from home. So... You want more analysis? Now people are asking, not enough analysis. I got more analysis for you. If this were my company... Uh-huh. Which it's not... It is not. Okay? No. It was my company. Yes. And there's one of two things is going to happen. Io Shirai is going to get paid a lot more money and go to the main roster where she will have good matches uh-huh. and entertain the fans. That would be cool. Or I'm going to pay her even more money to stay in NXT and try and teach these blow cats how to work. Okay? Yeah. yeah. But you know what you don't do? What's that? You don't keep her there trying to teach people how to work and pay her developmental money. She didn't sign up to be a coach. Yeah. But you know what? It's not my company. And neither of these things are going to happen. So, go home and be happy. 32 years old. Hang out old. with your family. 32 years old. Been wrestling now for literally half of her life. Still got a lot more to give. So, yeah, I'd like to see her back in stardom again for sure. Hope that guy's happy. You accomplished your goal. You wound me up and you stepped away. Back in a moment, Observer Live. We're back here on the show. Brian Alvarez here. Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of Wrestling Observer. Look at, look at these guys just so full of joy to have pulled the string. Mm-mm-mm. Well. You know, it's funny as they pull the string and I explode. And then they don't want me to yell so much. Is that what happens when your string gets pulled? You just explode all over the place? Gee, quit yelling so much, Brian. Gee, too much caps lock. Gee, here's the other one I got. What, a, what about Braun? What about, what about Braun what? Breaker? What does uh, Braun Breaker have to do with Io Shirai? I have no idea. Because I said ones can't miss? Well, obviously Io Shirai is can't miss, except for Vince. So she's miss. Yeah. Literally, the storyline in NXT. Do you know what the storyline on the show was this past? Uh, you must know because you watch it, Mike. Yeah. Literally, the storyline is if Cameron Grimes beats Braun Breaker, Braun Breaker's just going right to SummerSlam for a push. That's actually yes. the story they're telling. Yes. So, yes. Yes. It would, be, it would be a good thing if you lose because then you might be on Raw or SmackDown or you might be on SummerSlam. The, these were words said by and Cameron Grimes has got nothing left. It's the bottom of the barrel. If he can't win the NXT title, like, what's below NXT? I guess nothing. Dirt. You might as well be dead under the ground. That's what Cameron Grimes was actually kind of saying. Actually, what's lower than NXT is being one of those security guys that hasn't made NXT TV yet. Gets beat up every day. Well, AMJF was one of those one time. You saw how that worked out for him. Well, you know, a lot of people have been. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> should be. Hey, you know uh, earn, Money in the Bank's tomorrow, your, everybody? Your keep. What's that? Yeah, Money in the Bank's tomorrow. So I'm going to watch yeah. the Money in the Bank. And uh, tomorrow night, only for subscribers to WrestlingObserver.com, Dave and I will review the show. And then Vinny Craig and I will review it on Sunday, not Saturday, because uh, Vinny's busy celebrating his anniversary on Saturday night. Oh, nice. And, uh, I'll see you blokes on uh, Tuesday because there's no show Monday because it's the 4th of July. And I'm going to be blowing stuff up like my body. And we'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.